now putting the expression for the vector identity back into the equation we get m time derivative of velocity of the charged particle is given by minus q times gradient of v plus partial derivative of the magnetic vector potential with respect to time plus q times gradient of v dot a minus q times v dot gradients times a now let us rearrange this equation so that it works out better we will take this term here to the left hand side and take this term here to the left hand side so after rearranging the equation becomes m dv by dt plus q times del a by del t plus v dot gradient times a is equal to minus q times gradient of v vector minus v dot a now we will use this expression for the magnetic vector potential where it is a function of both the position coordinate r and time t so the total derivative of a with respect to time is given by del a by del r which is nothing but the partial derivative of a with respect to r into dr by dt plus del a by del t which is nothing but the partial derivative of a with respect to time into dt by dt now this dt by dt will be equal to 1 and dr by dt is nothing but the velocity of the charged particle so the total derivative of a with respect to time becomes da by dt equals to del a by del r times velocity plus del a by del t now da by dt is equal to v del a by del r plus del a by del t we can write this first expression as such v dot x cap del by del x plus y cap del by del y plus z cap del by del z whole multiplied by a vector plus del a by del t and you know this expression is nothing but the gradient operator so the equation becomes da by dt equals to v dot gradient operator times a plus del a by del t this expression gives the convective derivative of the magnetic vector potential a that is the time rate of change of a at the location of the moving particle to understand the concept of convective derivative let us take the following example here a swimmer is standing in a lake facing the sun so as the day progresses the lake will become warmer due to the sun and the swimmer is aware of this fact let us consider r vector to be the position vector of the swimmer with respect to some arbitrary origin o now the swimmer will always be stationary that is dr by dt is equal to 0 the position of the swimmer will not change with respect to time now at in the morning the lake will be relatively cooler and in the afternoon the lake will get warmer and the evening the lake will cool down again the swimmer will be able to feel the changes in the temperature of the lake because he is aware of the presence of the sun now let us change the situation a bit now the lake is a motionless lake where one end is constantly at a colder temperature and the other end is constantly at a hotter temperature now we have allowed the swimmer to swim from the cold end to the hot end that is the position of the swimmer is not constant with time so when the swimmer moves from the cold end to the hot end he will be able to detect the change in temperature of the lake along the direction of its motion here we are not telling the swimmer about the presence of the sun he is unaware of the presence of the sun so the only way he can detect the change in temperature of the lake is through its motion and such a detection is known as convective derivative that is it detects the change by changing its position along that direction now we have the definition of convective derivative of a that is da by dt equals to del a by del t plus v dot del times a substituting it back to the equation that we were deriving we get m dv by dt plus q times da by dt minus v dot gradient of a 
plus v dot gradient of a is equal to minus q into gradient of v minus v dot a. Here uh, the first two terms cancel out inside the square bracket so one gets dy dt of m plus q times a equals to minus q gradient times capital V minus v dot a. Now you can notice that this equation takes the form of Newton's second law of motion. So the left side of the equation represents the time derivative of a quantity that looks like momentum and the right side denotes the gradient of a quantity that looks like potential energy. So in totality this equation looks similar to Newton's second law of motion. Now the term mv plus qa is given by p which is nothing but the canonical momentum and the term q times capital V minus v dot a is the effective potential energy experienced by the charged particle and now it is velocity dependent which is evident from the above equation. Now suppose there is no external magnetic field experienced by the charged particle that is a vector is equal to zero. Substituting this value of a into the equation we get d by dt of mv equals to minus q gradient of v. This is nothing but the old equation that you are familiar with and you get back the old momentum p equals to m times v. Now let's go back to the case where the charged particle was experiencing a non-zero magnetic field and evaluate the kinetic energy associated with it. Kinetic energy is given by half mv square and we just read that the conjugate momentum p is given by mv vector plus qa vector or mv vector is p minus qa vector. Substituting this value back into the expression for kinetic energy we get kinetic energy is mv whole square by 2m that is nothing but 1 by 2m times p vector minus qa vector whole square. So this expression gives the kinetic energy associated with a particle with charge q moving in a magnetic field with a vector potential a. Now let us study the Bohr van Leeuwen theorem. It is a classical theorem that states in a classical system there is no thermal equilibrium magnetization that is if you consider a classical system they should not have any net magnetization but as we shall see in upcoming slides the statement is completely wrong and thus it gives rise to the need of quantum mechanics to explain the magnetization in a magnetic material. Now we shall try to prove the bohr van leeuwen theorem. Consider a magnetic moment mu placed in a magnetic field B. Its energy is given by minus mu dot P. Here mu is proportional to E and mu is proportional to the magnetization M of the system. Hence M is proportional to E. That is the magnetization of a system is proportional to the rate of change of its energy due to the applied field. Now if you consider the Lorentz force F acting on a charged particle Q in a magnetic field B, it is given by F equals to Q E times plus V cross B. So the magnetic field will always exert a force that is perpendicular to the velocity of the charged particle. And as you know work done is given by force into displacement. For this case the force and the displacement are perpendicular to each other. So the work done by the magnetic field on the charged particle will be zero. Hence the magnetization and the energy of the system cannot depend on the magnetic field. This is in contradiction to the statement we proved earlier. Hence the energy of the system does not depend on the magnetic field. So there can be no magnetization in the system. So this is basically the gist of bohr van leeuwen theorem. Consider a material shown by the big circle. Here the material is kept in an applied field P. Here the electrons are therefore performing cyclotron orbit due to the application of magnetic field. The electrons well inside the material can complete their loop and hence will give rise to a magnetic moment mu given by current times the area of the loop. 
However, the electrons close to the boundary of the material cannot complete their loop and they perform something which is known as skipping orbit. Now the net anticlockwise current due to the electron at the bulk of the material cancels out the net clockwise current due to the electrons present near the boundary of the material. Hence the resultant current becomes equal to zero and there is no net magnetization. This forms the simple proof of this Vohr van Leeuwen theorem. But in real materials, real magnetic materials, there is a net magnetization produced when it is kept in an applied magnetic field. So there must be a very fundamental flaw in this theorem. That is, we have used classical concepts to prove this theorem, which is wrong. Quantum mechanics has to be brought into the forefront to explain why there is a non-zero magnetic moment associated with a magnetic material when it is kept in a magnetic field. And this we shall cover in our next, next lecture when we introduce you to the quantum mechanics of spin. In the next lecture of my channel Fun with Fundamentals, I will cover the quantum mechanics of spin. For that, please give a like, share and subscribe my channel to keep the inflow of free content. Thank you.